to uh, uh, kickstart the symposium with uh, Josh Karp, who's going to be uh, talking to us about neurotrans. The floor is yours. Okay, am I position all right? Okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Josh Karp. I'm a PhD student at the University of Michigan and also working for the summer and possibly longer at the Center for Open Science. We will have shirts at our sprints tomorrow uh, and at our BOF tonight at 7. Please attend if you're interested. Okay. So I want to start with a little story. When I was an undergrad, I read this paper. It came out in Science 2005, and it was super exciting, talking about this brain region, anterior reticular cortex. And I was like, this is life-changing, revolutionary. I want to study this, go to grad school, and research this topic. And I went to grad school, but I didn't work on that topic because just the next year, there was a new article saying, actually, those findings, total crap. We tried this study three times, couldn't find a trace of that result. The year after that, the original group came back and said, actually, you guys are full of crap because we tried it again and we still got it. Um, so I was thinking this might not be the best topic for a PhD thesis because I don't know what's going on here. Uh, and, and this probably is not an unusual occurrence uh, either in neuroimaging or in any empirical research. Um, there are various estimates of the rate of false positive results in neuroimaging uh, using a study using uh, published thresholds estimated about 17% of activations are false positives. Studies using meta-analysis estimated between 10% and 40% of all activations are false positives. And uh, anybody in neuroimaging probably knows Nancy Kamosher at MIT on a blog, on a, a comment on a blog post last year, she estimated that uh, way less than half of published findings in imaging would actually replicate. And I don't know how she got that number, but she's real famous, so maybe it's true. Um, okay, so there's, this raises the question of why would published results not replicate? Um, and one possibility, uh, is, that, is that someone just got it wrong. Uh, someone got a false positive, someone got a false negative, there was a mistake in some analysis, things like that. Alternatively, uh, it's possible that multiple groups with different results just aren't doing quite the same thing. There's some subtle or not so subtle difference in the question being asked and the methods being used that means the two groups actually aren't looking at compatible issues. Um, and so just as a plausibility check, we can ask if methods actually matter. If I use a different software package or a different uh, smoothing kernel or whatever, does it actually make a difference? So as kind of some background, I, I tried this a couple years ago, uh, taking one data set in neuroimaging and analyzing it many different ways, actually about 7,000 ways. Um, so I just generated a bunch of different pipelines, different software, different parameters, and analyzed the same experiment to see what I got. And I, I was a little troubled by this because uh, actually every brain region in the data set, was, oh, sorry, nine tenths of regions in the data set were active at least one time including parts of the brain that really shouldn't ever be sort of active in an fMRI sense, including ventricles, white matter, skull, things that really shouldn't be, you know, lighting up. Uh, so that was a bit troubling. I've got a little illustration of how this worked. Um, so across the 7,000 pipelines, I'm plotting the peak activation coordinate uh, colored by the by, as a function of how often it was, it was the peak across pipelines. And so the question of, okay, given some experiment, given some contrast, where is the peak activation happening? The answer seems to be, well, it kind of depends on what software you used. Um, okay, so it seems like, like methods matter, but we can ask, do they actually vary this much? Is this just an extreme case of methods that nobody uses? So second piece of background, I uh, actually hand-coded a bunch of article uh, text files looking for a bunch of different methods parameters. Uh, this took a long time. It was 200 some articles and really, really boring to do. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but I coded parameters like, spatial, like smoothing kernels, um, which you can see here, varied across studies by a factor of, of over fourfold from the smallest to largest smoothing kernel. Similar story for um, other parameters, like in this case, um, high pass filter cutoffs. And if I had more than 12 minutes, I could just flood you with more and more of these slides showing that people, people use almost every combination of parameters that, that, that they possibly could. Uh, methods are actually highly variable across published imaging studies. And that's only what's reported. People often do little, little tweaks, and, and no one has enough text to write down every last step of their detail, of uh, their analysis detail. And by the way, no, almost nobody actually shares MATLAB code on GitHub, which is maybe, maybe for the best because it's very ugly code. But anyway, uh, so to summarize so far, uh, methods matter and methods also vary kind of a lot. Um, but coding methods by hand is, I can attest from personal experience, kind of terrible. Uh, so what we need is some kind of, some kind of machine-readable uh, database of methods used in, in different studies so that you can look up for a given study that you're reading, maybe you're skeptical, maybe different studies have different conclusions and you want to know why, uh, which methods were used, 
without having to read each article, dig into the supplemental materials, and figure out exactly what was done. Especially if you're coding like not two articles, but you know hundreds. Um, so this is the problem that I'm trying to begin to address with with neurotrends. Um, the idea here is to have software to take raw text and extract uh, a whole bunch of different methods from the text and, and build this machine readable database of methods and parameters used in neuroimaging analysis. So uh, what I have so far is um, very simple PubMed query. This is the query text here. Um, and I tried to build a query that would capture basically all uh, neuroimaging research on human cognition. Um, that's the query if anybody cares. Uh, this yields about 16,000 articles. I was able to automatically get most of them. So I have HTML copies of, I can't see my own slides here, uh, about 85% PDFs of even more. Some PDFs are old formatted with no, no metadata, so I've OCR'd those. So I've got full text for the bulk of, of published articles on, on cognition and, and neuroimaging. Um, and then basically, right now it's very simple. It's just a bunch of regular expressions for each different um, parameter and uh, each procedure, each parameter. So this includes things like software, things like uh, steps like spatial smoothing, high pass filtering, significance testing, multiple, correct multiple comparison corrections, and basically you name it. So here's a sample article, and this is what I think I know about the article just from the raw text without actually looking at it myself. So I think this article, let me see. Used Java, used uh, motion, motion correction, used spatial normaliza normalization, and, and so on. This is what I think I know about this article. Um, so the first question is, you know, does this actually work? Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm plotting across everything that I'm coding in, in these regular expression patterns. Uh, D prime scores, these basically uh, index the trade-off between sort of false, uh, true positives and false positives. And there are a few uh, towards the left that indicate sort of okay, better than chance, but not good performance. Most of them, though, are, are in this sort of tolerable range. So overall, the performance is uh, not perfect, but, but adequate. Um, I can tell you uh, why, when it fail, why it fails when it fails now and then. Um, we're looking at raw text, and you'll see phrases like, uh, we didn't use spatial smoothing, or future studies should, do, should use higher field magnets, or other things like that. Um, or see our previous work, see our supporting methods. So there are definitely things that are very tricky to parse uh, using, that, using raw text like this, parsing negations, parsing outside documents that are linked, and things like this. But mostly it works fairly well. And so right off, we can begin to ask questions about what kinds of tools people use in neuroimaging at a large enough scale to do interesting stuff. So here's kind of a sort of a sanity check. Uh, here I'm plotting different versions of SPM people are using, SPM being by far the most popular software used for neuroimaging, neuroimaging analysis. And this kind of makes sense. Here I'm plotting uh, different versions, and, and these correspond to the release history of the software, given a two or three year lag. So here's the year each, each uh, package released, and you can see it takes a couple years in most cases, but people actually begin to use that software after a little while. Um, this actually gives you a nice sort of version adoption curve for the software. Um, so if you're a developer for SPM, you might, know, you might be able to tell from this that, by the way, it'll take three or four years for the community to actually use your software. You can figure out that uh, in 2009, people might be, might be using four different versions of your software going back to 1999, for example. Um, but this is, this is mostly just a sanity check. So then we can begin to ask questions like, um, which parameters are reported well or not so well? So one thing that everybody reports, which is reassuring, is, is sort of magnet field strength. So this is a plot of uh, magnet strength over time. Um, and you can see that as time goes from 98 to 2012, people start using more powerful magnets, um, which is probably good. But the, the important point here is that people actually almost always report their field strength. So just simplifying this plot, 95% um, plus of articles report field strength, and that's constant over time. So that's good. People, people can report this parameter. Other stuff, not so much. Um, so a lot of these experiments involve showing human subjects pictures, tasks, whatever else, and those pictures are presented using, using software. Uh, and different packages might, present, uh, might collect timing in different ways, pre uh, present, present images in different ways, and so on. And yet, almost nobody reports the software that they, that they used to do this. So the proportion has been increasing over time, but it's gone from like 20% to 30%. Um, so really, nobody's describing the software being used for sort of experimental control. Um, similar, similar case with basic information like operating system. So there's been some really scary work coming out recently on um, very different results coming out of uh, FreeSurfer, depending on whether you're running on uh, 
different versions, even of OS X, Linux, you can get very discrepant results, and uh, which shouldn't happen. I think they're working on that, I hope. Um, but you can see here that, that very few articles actually report, by the way, which OS did we use to run our analysis? This fraction's around uh, 20%, and that's constant across observed time. Um, we can also begin to ask how variable pipelines are across papers. Uh, so very simple analysis here. I'm just showing the, the number of unique pipelines considering all analysis features that are used within any given year. And this fracture is increasing a lot over time. The dip at the end is just an artifact of uh, stuff not being on PubMed at the end, so don't worry about that. Um, this is not normalized. This is just number of pipelines total. So I also want to consider the number of articles published each year, which has a similar shape. And then I should normalize and divide the number of pipelines by the number of articles, which looks like this. Uh, this can range from zero to one. And right now, it's about 0.9, which means there are almost as many pipelines used as articles published each year. So by this metric, which I'll admit is pretty crude, um, we're approaching sort of maximum methods variability. Um, <laughs> there's, there's not much room to make methods more variable from one article to the next. And maybe there's a good reason for that, but it's, it's a bit surprising. Um, brief tangent, because I've got like a minute and a quarter. Uh, why do methods vary so much across papers? Uh, and I think one, one contribution is just geographical. Um, so these articles give me uh, information about where they're published. So here I'm plotting uh, which analysis package people use, SPM, FSL, and so on, as a function of what city they're in. So this is a map of, of the UK, part of the UK. And uh, different, different parts of the UK have very different distributions of software. And there's a reason for that. So uh, in this, in this uh, city on the left, this is Oxford. Uh, the dominant package here is FSL. FSL is developed at Oxford. We move on to London, where SPM is developed, and SPM is the dominant package in London. And then the last city here is Cambridge. SPM also dominates, and it turns out that one of the SPM gurus, Rick Henson, moved there like 10 years back. So everybody there uses him as a consultant for analysis, so they are, they're an SPM shop. So there's some, there's some pattern to this variability in methods, just simple illustration here. Um, so to summarize, uh, it's possible to extract method information automatically and with tolerable accuracy from raw text. Um, some parameters are reported well, other parameters are reported quite poorly, and some of them are likely to matter a lot for, for results. Um, and the variability of methods across papers is pretty high and appears to be growing over time. Um, so that's sort of a review of what this can do so far. There are really cool applications I'm excited to be working on. Um, this could be really useful for meta-analysis if you'd like to figure out if different methods lead to different results, if you want to do quality control for peer review. Um, and I think it's going to be very cool to, to approach this from the point of view of information diffusion. So how do ideas, method methods spread across labs, collaborators, advisor-student relationships, and so on? Um, if you're interested in helping out or using the data, that would be great. Uh, there's a lot of room for expansion in terms of new annotations, new, new uh, content domains. Right now it's only imaging, but it would be great to expand this, this logic to non-imaging stuff, to clinical trials, to your field of choice. Um, there's uh, work to do on the code. It works, but it, I'm rewriting most of it now. Um, if anybody wants to get involved with that, uh, please let me know. Um, and I'm going to release the data uh, in their full form. I can give you a, a file dump now, and there'll be an API available in a few weeks. So if anybody wants to remix this, do something cool, uh, feel free. That would be great. Um, oops, don't need those. Um, so uh, I'm over by a minute, so I'm sorry. Uh, but um, please come to our sprints from the Center for Open Science to, uh, tomorrow and Saturday. Uh, and if you'd like to come to our Birds of Feather session tonight at 7 in room 204 here, uh, please join us, and I'll take questions. Yeah, so the question is, am I claiming that, um, that no one's replicating anybody else and, and uh, there are almost as many uh, pipelines as papers? Um, by the somewhat crude metrics that I'm using, that's what I'm claiming. I'm not saying it's, I'm not judging. Uh, I'm just observing. But that's, that's how things seem, yeah. Uh, so the question is, how, how would one, or how would I, probably not me, incentivize um, people replicating each other's work more directly? 
Uh, I think that the most promising direction I've seen is basically better software. Um, so most people that I've talked to are using sort of totally custom software, their own not very nice MATLAB scripts their lab made 10 years ago. Uh, if people begin switching to, uh, for example, Python-based tools like NiPipe, which include really nice uh, optimized workflows, that would reduce a lot of variability and probably lead to better method selection off the bat. I also don't think, this, this is a broader question, but I don't think that replication in general is, con is considered valuable. If people's goal was to replicate someone's work precisely, they could try and do that. But that's not really anyone's goal right now because that's not really what you're worried for in science. So that's a bigger question that I, I frankly can't answer right now. Okay, so I have one question. Uh, are you interacting or do you plan to interact with Neurosynth? Uh, yep. Uh, the question is, am I, am I interacting with Neurosynth? Uh, yeah, I, I sent Tal, the developer of Neurosynth, uh, a copy of all the data. Uh, it's, it will be exposed as a feature set on Neurosynth as soon as Tal has time. But yeah, so Neurosynth, as, as context, is a, sort of an automated meta-analysis platform for all of neuroimaging. And I think there's great possibilities for um, sort of doing meta-analysis in that, in that framework, um, combining information about methodological quality, software packages, and things like that. So that's, that's in the works, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.